And that's an exciting challenge to us as we now enter a new year. It's the kind of passage that you could use every Sunday during the year and still not have exhausted all that it has to say to us. So what has this traditionally Christmas portion of John's Gospel got to say to us as we embark on 2024? Well, I've chosen just one word from it, and it comes in verse 10. We read, the world did not recognize him. Recognize, that's my one word. And to be honest, throughout my ministry, I have preferred using, as you do here in Lock Brooklyn, using the Good News Bible uh, in worship and in study with groups uh, within the congregation. I find it by far and away the easiest for people to get to grips with and to understand. And yet on this occasion, I actually do believe that the King James Version or even the New International Version express the, the, ver the verse just a little bit better. Those of you who are of a certain age, like myself, will remember in the King James Version, the world knew him not. The world knew him not, rather than did not recognize him. The New International Version has the world did not know him. And the point that I want to develop with you today is that neither the, word, the English word recognize nor the English word know actually can fully express the, the depth of the word that John uses in his gospel. You see, like the, the rest of the, the New Testament, John's gospel was written in Greek. But it doesn't just contain Greek thinking. There are also a lot of Hebrew, Jewish concepts wrapped up in it as well. In Greek, the, the verb genosko is a word that has to do with mental processes, with the brain. It's all to do with seeing and recognizing and understanding, working things out for yourself, discovering the truth about things for yourself. And the verb to know in Hebrew couldn't actually be more different. It's a word that centers on relationship. It has got to do with your feelings and your emotions and so on. And so for a Jew to know another person isn't just a matter of recognition or of knowledge. It has to do with having a, an intense personal relationship with that other person or persons. And when John uses this verb, to know, he isn't limiting himself to just the, the, Jew, the, the Greek way of knowing things intellectually. Implicit in what he's saying is that there is also an intimate relational sense to knowing this word made flesh. And so his gospel that was written for Greeks and for Jews and for us, his gospel begins with a presentation of Jesus that cannot be expressed solely in terms of just one culture. And so this, the climax that comes in verse 14, the word became a human being, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The, the challenge is for his Greek readers to wrestle with the idea that what God is like can actually be expressed through a human being. For years they've been loving, enjoying, discussing and arguing about things like this. And now they're being told that it's more than that. They can actually experience it through a relationship. And so 
bridging Greek and Jewish ways of thinking, John introduces his gospel. And it would appear that he had absolutely no knowledge of the virgin birth. Otherwise, why wouldn't he have included it? He appears to have had no knowledge of the other traditions that are so much a part and parcel of our Christmas celebrations, the, the stories that are included in Matthew and Luke's gospel, no mention about shepherds or angels, no mention about wise men. Instead, he plunges straight in and using the thoughts and the patterns of these two very different cultures, he maps out, if you like, for us a path by which both of them and we ourselves can then come to know Jesus. But as John says, the world didn't recognize him. The world does not know him. And if we're to be brutally honest with ourselves, we don't recognize him. We don't know him either. Not completely. You see, we can't. Because we're finite human beings. And he is infinite. He is eternal. We're the, the product of particular cultures. Subcultures. And God isn't one of us. Nor is he one of them. Yet, he does come and meet us within all of our different cultures. And so, here's the challenge that comes to us through the word made flesh. And first, there's the Greek challenge. The Greek challenge. To know God, to recognize Jesus for who he is, means that we're going to have to use our intelligence our reason. We're not expected to park our brains outside the church door when we come to uh, worship on a Sunday morning. We're not required to set our intelligence aside when it comes to matters of faith. In fact, quite the opposite. God doesn't expect us to believe that what we learn in other areas of life is irrelevant to faith. And yet at times, the church has behaved as though God needs to be protected. So it's, it's denied the, the, the insights of, of great thinkers, people like Galileo. It was only as recently as 1991 that the Roman Catholic Church actually apologized for having opposed the insights that he had brought to humankind so many hundreds of years earlier. You think also about what Charles Darwin said about evolution and so on. And there are still in the church today people who actually stand against what science has taught us in that whole area. I wonder why they do that. Is it because they feel that they need to protect God? Or is it, perhaps, that they're trying to protect the power of the church? The ability to think and to reason, those are our Creator's gift to us. Faith and the ability to use our intelligence are not wide apart. They are not incompatible. Because God... God is the source of both. And using both can bring us into a deeper and more uh, wholesome commitment to him. That's the Greek challenge, using our intellect. And then there's the Hebrew challenge. That is to realize that knowing God, recognizing Jesus as Lord is all about relationship. It's about coming closer to God and being intimate with him. 
the stories that we have about Jesus' life make it absolutely clear that he never set out to try to establish some kind of intellectual elite. We're told rather that he was glad that things that have been hidden from the wise were revealed to little children. Wonderful. And so he taught theology, he taught his hearers about what God was like through very simple, straightforward, everyday kind of stories. And so whatever our intellectual ability might be, doesn't matter, whatever our intellectual ability, we can be in relationship, we can be in community with God and with other people, whether they be people who share our faith or whether they don't. And there are two kinds of aspects to that knowing. On the one hand, we're invited to be intimate with God. Jesus invites us to be his friends. It's as simple as that. And knowing God, just like knowing any other human being, is an intimate relationship. And so it can never be static. It can never stand still. Just as knowing another human being is an ongoing and never completed activity, so too with our knowledge of God. You only have to think about the challenges that have come to the church through the changes that have taken place in culture in recent time and how those changes have enriched indeed our understanding of God. The feminist movement, for example, has enabled men and women to discover more about the totality of God's personality. And so we can think of him as both male and female with the kind of uh, values and outlooks that come from either side of the, the sexual divide. Or think about liberation theology, which was developed first in Africa and South America, which now has encouraged us to recognize that if we're to proclaim a kingdom, the kingdom of God, then we must have a deep concern for issues like justice and peace and equality. We're called to a growing intimacy with God through our ongoing study of Scripture, through prayer, yes, but also called to be more intimate with God by keeping ourselves abreast of what other disciplines are revealing to us about the wonders of God's creation. We're to be intimate with God, but as well as being intimate with God, we're also called to an intimacy with other people. The kind of intimacy that gets to know people as people, rather than settles for thinking that we know them because of what school they attended or what church they go to or don't go to, as the case may be, what political party they support, how they behave in certain situations. Not that casual kind of knowing, but a deeper intimacy that gets to know them as people. And so we need to be courageous. We need to step outside the comfort of our own culture, our own circle. We need to accept the differences that do exist between us. Accept them not just as being inevitable, but actually being a delight. Something that enriches our world and our experience beyond measure. Often when people disagree, the tendency is for one person to impose their outlook, their opinion on the other person. Or even to deny the possibility even that the other person might have a legitimate point of view. 
But the knowing to which the Bible calls us, the knowing that we see in the ministry of Jesus, that kind of knowing is a delight in knowing that other person as one with whom God also has an intimate relationship. The world did not recognize him. The world did not know him. And no matter how committed we are, we don't recognize him completely, totally. We can't. But we are called to continue on a twofold journey of discovery. As I hinted earlier, that centers on a commitment to intelligent and rigorous Bible study and the development of our own devotional lives. That on the one hand, but on the other then the desire to know him more intimately and more thoroughly through those with whom we share life, through those with whom we share family life, church life, <coughs> community life. Indeed, with all those with whom we share this planet. That's the, the continuing mission to which you and I are called. Confident that God will lead us as we seek to know him better. Because through knowing him in an intimate, developing way, he will enrich our lives beyond measure. May that be so in the year that lies ahead. Let's pray. And I want to, in a slightly different way, uh, lead our prayers of intercession today. I'm going to take a very well-known hymn. You'll find it at 345 in the Irish hymn book. I heard the voice of Jesus say. And we'll take each of the stanzas in it as a guide to the next part of our prayer. So join with me. I heard the voice of Jesus say, Come unto me and rest. Lay down, O weary one. Lay down your head upon my breast. Loving God, we bring our prayers today for all those who are exhausted and need rest. For those suffering from long COVID or ME or any other post-viral fatigue. We pray too for those who are continuing to work on the front line, whether it be in our hospitals, <laughs> or in our fire service, our police service, all those having to deal with intense public suffering day in and day out, those <clears throat> more recently facing the challenges of the flooding, all who desperately need time to rest and recover, we bring them to you. I heard the voice of Jesus say, Behold, I freely give thee living water, thirsty one. Stoop down and drink and live. God of living water, we pray this new year for all those who need clean water in order to live and thrive. For all who are suffering in whatever way through the effects of global warming. Those whose water supplies have been polluted by flooding. Those who are suffering immensely because of year after year drought. And we pray too for those whose homes and livelihoods have been damaged or destroyed by the recent severe floods. <clears throat> I heard the voice of Jesus say, I am this dark world's light. Look unto me, 
the dawn shall rise and all your day be bright. We pray, O oh God, for all those who need your guidance, those who need to hear your voice at the beginning of this new year. There is so much that is dark and disturbing in our world today. And we pray that you will use us to mirror your kindness and love to them. May we be the conduits of your light into our local community and into our church. I look to Jesus and I found in him my star, my sun. And in that light of life I'll walk till traveling days are done. Eternal God, gather us into your own presence when our traveling days are done. Bring us to your eternal light, there to be reunited with all whom we've loved and lost, there to be able to worship you in glory forever and ever. Amen. Really, no other hymn that we could finish with on the first Sunday of a new year. Lord, for the years your love has kept and guided. <coughs> Let's now go to serve him in the world. 
May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.